I'm Marty Stauffer. Our oldest mountains are worn with time and not half as tall as the Rockies, but lush in vegetation, they're no less spectacular. And when spring arrives, the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia explode with vitality. Except for a few meadows, Shenandoah National Park is nearly covered by forest. Wildlife can find ample cover and nourishment in the burst of new life. In this season of birth, wildflowers emerge, the flowering trees and shrubs begin to bloom, and all living things rejoice. Join me as we walk in the splendor of a Shenandoah springtime. In winter, these mountains appear forbidding and desolate. White-tailed deer seem to wait for something more nourishing than brushy brows. It's March. Deer find it difficult to survive until the first green shoots appear. But soon the ice begins to melt, slowly at first, then it becomes rivulets and streams as winter retreats northward. Fresh from hibernation in the forest duff, wood frogs find spawning pools and each other. There's fierce competition for available females. Here a number of male Romeos follow a single desirable Juliet. They push and shove like shoppers at a sale, but the outcome is usually decided by sound rather than action. The oblivious frogs provide this opportunistic crow with a feast. He snatches a mating pair. Undaunted, the frogs continue their single-minded competition, in spite of the danger from the crow. A male approaches from behind, coming from the pack of would-be suitors, and makes his move. Popeye-like forearms and bulbous thumbs allow this male to firmly grip his intended mate behind her front legs. The frogs stay locked together like this for some time. Stroking her with his hind legs, he stimulates the female to release masses of gelatinous eggs from her cloaca. As she does so, 
the male fertilizes them with sperm. female can lay as many as 20,000 eggs. Spring comes in spurts to Shenandoah, as if uncertain of its welcome. Rain and fog roll in from the nearby Atlantic coast and freeze in thick coats of glistening ice. It sounds like crystal chandeliers falling when the ice-covered limbs come crashing down. Trees take on fantastic shapes, gnarled by successive years of spring storms. These veterans of many storms look less like trees than fanciful gargoyles. Just the same, a gray squirrel prefers these oak and pine forests. Normally solitary, a pair of possums come together to mate. They're not the most graceful of animals even on the ground, and apparently they're not meant for aerial acrobatics. The possums' prehensile tails are strong enough to support their entire weight, and it looks like a good thing. These primitive marsupials seem to have their hands full simply staying in the tree. Evening rises from the hollows and shadows march up the hills. High above the forest floor, a great horned owl offers its young a snake. The female owl lays her eggs as much as four days apart, and she begins incubating them as soon as the first one is laid. The largest owlet has the advantage and when food is in short supply, it may actually devour its smaller siblings. It's certainly the more aggressive. It downs the snake whole. A huge full moon appears reddish in the haze. I half expect to see an Appalachian witch fly by its face. In mid-April, deciduous trees are still bare, but with the warmer weather comes new life, reaching for the light.
hills begin to take on color as the trees clothe themselves in tender new leaves. Wild turkeys strut their stuff. Fan-tailed toms show off before a harem of hens. Their loud, characteristic gobbling carries across the hollows. Blue as the spring sky, a male eastern bluebird looks for a mate. The female hears his call, which he continues for a few days after she's on the territory. The park is also a magnet for bird watchers. Bluebirds are among the 200 species of birds in Shenandoah, 100 of which may nest here. By late April, Shenandoah begins to flower in earnest. Petal-like bracts of dogwood light up the mountainsides like a thousand candles. Hot pink redbud is another small tree of the understory. Later, its flowers will be replaced by edible pods. Butterflies emerge to enjoy the nectar flow as spring gains a foothold. Although the rocky wildness of the Blue Ridge Mountains makes me feel quite isolated, our nation's capital is actually nearby. Washington, D.C. is only 85 miles away. Baltimore, Richmond, Norfolk, Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia are all within driving distance, so it's not surprising that two million people a year enjoy the beauty of this national park. Now early May has warmed the water, and the wood frog's eggs have hatched. The pool squirms with tadpoles. These have already begun to develop vestigial legs. Most of these tadpoles will not survive. If they all did, we'd be knee-deep in wood frogs by summer. A gray catbird has laid four blue eggs in a well-hidden nest. The male and female have identical plumage, but we can tell them apart by their actions. Only the female sits on the eggs, and only the male sings from a conspicuous perch. But both meow. A female black bear has recently awakened from her winter's nap. There may be as many as 300 black bears in Shenandoah, up from the 35 or so when the park was first designated. These cubs were born during mother's winter sleep. They're beginning to explore their world in a secluded hollow.
In mid-June, nature wears a full-dress uniform. Flowers have opened and trees are fully leafed. But a female cardinal wears camouflage as she sits on her nest. She's nearly invisible in the thick foliage. The bright red male is more easily spotted against the green. Bulge-eyed nestlings await his coming. Like babies everywhere at feeding time, they're hungry. Many seed eaters, like these cardinals, become insectivorous when feeding young. Over and over, he passes his mate a part of his catch as they share a seemingly endless task. The cardinal is the Virginia state bird, so these should feel right at home in Shenandoah. A female turkey urges her chicks from the nest with a special call. These are only days old. They're as tiny as quail in comparison to their mother's three-foot height. Deer are usually wary, but these seem to know they're safe in the open. In a display of exuberance, these yearlings express the lightheartedness of the season. A new fawn is concentrating on eating. There's no distracting this baby for fun. The young deer chase and box one another, splashing the nearby adults as well. This play is serious business. It allows the young to practice skills they will need as adults. Soon, everyone joins in the merriment. Sunrise and sunset are often spectacular in the park. Coastal moisture and characteristic weather patterns enhance the show. This rufous-sided towhee greets the morning as it calls, drink your tea. Flicking its tail in response to possible danger, this mockingbird may be uncomfortably aware of our presence. Like the cardinal, the male mockingbird does his fair share. He hunts incessantly and makes many trips back and forth. This post is a favorite lookout. Both birds pause here each time before entering the nest.
a variety of caterpillars, beetles, moths, and other insects are fed to the growing young. A skipper feeds at a dwarf iris and pollinates the flower in the bargain. Young pileated woodpeckers beg for food at their nest hole high rise. Their tiny heads already wear the bright red family crest. At 15 inches long, this is our largest woodpecker. The most aggressive chick gets the grub, but it looks like an uncomfortable way to serve breakfast. Pileated woodpeckers thrive in the park's more remote sections. They've been driven from many parts of their ancestral range by loss of habitat. The eastern slopes of the park receive the most rainfall, thanks to the influence of the nearby Atlantic Ocean. Year-round, storms carry moisture inland, shrouding the hills in instant clouds. Over the warm spring earth, this moisture condenses and falls as rain. All this wetness makes a perfect habitat for salamanders. An afternoon rainstorm brings out some of these night active amphibians. As the rain stops, rivulets join and wash downstream. In a normal year, the Shenandoah Valley receives enough moisture to meet the most water-loving salamander's needs. This area of Virginia was once farmland, but the earth was soon depleted. The thin mountain soil was not able to support heavy feeding crops like corn or even the effects of grazing. Shenandoah National Park was dedicated by Franklin D. Roosevelt on July 3, 1936. Critics felt that this overworked, eroded land was too far from wilderness to qualify as a national park. But under the care of the National Park Service, the trees returned and the land was healed. This ancient mountain fastness has once again become a place of wonder. Here and there, the remains of fallen log cabins are preserved to remind us of what was and what is. This small, comical caterpillar seems innocent enough, but appearances can be deceiving. This is the voracious larval stage of the gypsy moth. Many millions of these creatures have crossed the northern borders of the park and are moving southward at an alarming rate, threatening to denude thousands of acres of land. Unfortunately, the rugged oaks that were so successful in reforesting the park are also the most susceptible. <gasps> 
But when infestations of gypsy moth caterpillars become serious, no trees are safe. Neither are vines, flowers, or grasses. These trees have been stripped completely bare of leaves. If the damage continues for more than a single growing season, they will die. In an effort to stop the devastation, park officials have recruited modern fighting methods. A helicopter, outfitted with a spraying mechanism, enters the fray. These copters are able to pinpoint applications of insecticide in specific areas. Loss and damage are inevitable, as they are a natural part of the cycle of death and rebirth. New, less susceptible trees may grow to take the place of the oaks. Still, we must continue to protect the beauty and health of these ancient mountains with their hard-won forests. And we must continue to learn how best to preserve them for generations to come. At the turn of the century, the rounded old peaks of Shenandoah were largely bare of trees. Yet in just four score years, they've reforested themselves. They've now returned to the paradise which existed when our nation was first settled. Our national park system deserves a lot of credit for helping preserve this Blue Ridge mountain majesty. But even more, this wilderness is testimony to the vitality of nature. Nowhere is the unending cycle of rebirth and renewal more evident than in a Shenandoah springtime. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.